Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, I am Rosa Cabrera, director of the Rafael Sintrón Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, better known as the LCC. Um, thank you for joining us in the Zona Abierta program, featuring the third season of radical research from BIPAC scholars at UIC. Um, Zona Abierta, for those of you who might not be familiar with um, uh, this series is one of uh, the LCC's premier public programs. Uh, it highlights the intersection of arts, humanities, science, culture, and civic life with presentations by local, national, and international artists, scholars, and community leaders about pressing social and environmental issues affecting the life of Latinx and Latin Americans while making connections to other communities. Um, today's program is the first of three presentations that the LCC is hosting this semester with the scholars who joined the Bridge to Faculty program at UIC the last two years. The presenters have been sharing their experiences and respective research through an intersectional lens, revealing the complexity and particularity of their research and how the life of those in the margins are impacted. The Bridge to Faculty program is a recruitment initiative of, um, in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Engagement designed to attract underrepresented postdoctoral scholars with the goal of a direct transition to a tenure track junior faculty position after two years. We are grateful to the Office of Diversity, the Honors College, and the Department of History for supporting today's presentation by Dr. Celso Mendoza from the Department of History, whose work re-examines a supposedly legendary Spanish victory in the conquest of Mexico, in which the conquistadors are said to have killed a great Aztec leader in the Battle of Otumba, using some of the earliest sources, especially indigenous accounts of the conquest Dr. Mendoza demonstrates that the popular Spanish account of the battle is a complete fabrication. According to indigenous sources, it was the Spaniards who left the battlefield defeated. Dr. Mendoza will use this case to argue the more uh, importance should be placed on indigenous accounts when writing the history of the conquest. A little bit about uh, Dr. Mendoza, who uh, specializes in the history of the Aztecs and uh, Nahuas of Mexico and their reactions and responses to Spanish colonialism in the 16th century, uncovering their resistance and discontent. He has written encyclopedia articles and book chapters on Me uh, Mexican and North American history and has done consulting for periodicals and entertainment, including comic books involving the Aztecs and the uh, Nahatra language. He's the recipient of several fellowships and awards, including the Social Science Research Council's International Dissertation Research Fellowship. When now pouring over um, Nahatra codices and colonial documents, Dr. Mendoza relishes the art of calligraphy trying to imitate the ornate scripts of the manuscripts he studies. Um, and he will have a wonderful presentation that I just speak briefly with a lot of visuals. So I think this is all uh, gonna be a, a treat for us. Um, you can find out more about um, his full bio in the link that um, I think it was just provided in the chat. Uh, so with that, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Mendoza. Uh, bienvenido. All right, am I on? It's my turn now? Okay, all right, let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay, everybody can see my screen. Everything is uh, is looking good. Yes. Okay. All right. Will Mr. Sakomati for the introduction. Muchas gracias for the introduction. How's everybody doing? Bienvenidos a mi charla. 
Today, I'm going to talk about a battle some of you might have heard of. It's supposed to be like one of the most pivotal battles of all time. Uh, it's supposed to be like this epic, unbelievable victory, like one of the most important battles of all time, according to a lot of historians. And I'm going to argue, you know what, not only is it not important, but the way people think it happened didn't really happen. And the reason why they think it happened the wrong way is because we're not paying enough attention to indigenous documents and we're carrying assumptions about European superiority. Uh, so the Battle of Otumba was uh, a battle well, like it in, in the introduction, um, as, as uh, she mentioned, it was a battle where the Spaniards supposedly outnumbered and at the last minute they uh, find the commander of the Aztec army, the Siwakot, the, the second in charge of the Aztec empire, and not only killed him but stole his banner and all the Aztecs just fleed because, I mean, they're these superstitious people and they think if you take the enemy's banner then... Uh, uh, it's all over. Um, so there are these very weak and weak-minded people. Uh, but before we get to the Battle of Otumba, let's look at what was going on in the conquest uh, uh, before then. Let me turn on the pointer here. So just to give some background of what led up to it, in November 8, 1519, as many of you know, Cortes peacefully entered Tenochtitlan. He met Montecuzoma on one of the causeways leading. Uh, Tenochtitlan is the Aztec city, which was on a lake. He met him there, you know, the meeting of two cultures. I think the moment where they supposedly met is commemorated in Mexico City. Uh, and they were received there peacefully. Uh, they, the Aztecs gave him treasure, gave him all kinds of things, treated them like good people. Uh, however, on May 1520, that peace ended when the Spaniards, as, it, as it's pictured here in these illustrations from the Florentine Codex, which is an indigenous account, uh, when they massacred some of the Aztecs that were celebrating in the main courtyard there, completely unprovoked, they were unarmed. That, a month later, led to an urban uprising against the Spaniards, and this is illustrated right here, where uh, the Aztecs, or Mexica, we'll use the, those words interchangeably, rose up against the Spaniards and forced the Spaniards to take refuge in a one of the palaces there, one of the Aztec palaces, which they barricaded and put cannons there, and that's depicted right here. And so in all of June 1520, there was this fierce urban uh, battle between uh, uh, the Aztecs where they were besieging the Spaniards inside one of the Aztec palaces. Uh, then a month later, the Aztecs chased the Spaniards out of the city. The Spaniards tried to leave the city by night uh, on June 30th, and it's called the Noche Triste. Uh, the Aztecs killed several Spaniards. And then after June 30th, after the Noche Triste, for uh, more than a week, the Aztec army was chasing the Spaniards all over central Mexico, killing many of them, killing many of their horses. And I mean, the Spaniards were basically defeated. And then July 9th, 1520, they reached a place called Otumba, where supposedly the Spaniards turned the tides, even though they were still basically defeated afterwards. But nobody's supposed to remember any of the victories the Aztecs had before. No, the Battle of Otumba is the most special thing, right? Because whenever Europeans do something, we got to give them a, a big applause there. Uh, and that's what I'll be talking about. And just for context, it was about a year later, in August 13th, 1521, when Cortes would eventually return to Tenochtitlan, besiege the capital city, and conquer the Aztec Empire. Uh, here is a map. This large gray thing here is a lake. This is a map that uh, my friend and map maker made for me, uh, Billy Sidera. Uh, this is, uh, they started here in Tenochtitlan, and this was their whole, they left on the Noche Triste, and this was their escape route. Uh, as they went all through all these towns, often massacring a lot of people in those towns, killing anybody that they came across. And then they ended up here in Otumba. Uh, and Otumba is very close to the border of Tlaxcala, which Apan is the, the first big city there in Tlaxcala. And this is important because Tlaxcala was an ally of the Spaniards. Um, they still hadn't committed a lot of forces to them, but uh, the Spaniards were trying to reach Tlaxcala. So they were trying to reach uh, Apan first and then head down to the, the capital city of Tlaxcala there. And Otumba right here was where the big battle happened, where that big star is. So the Battle of Otumba, July 9th, 1520. So the story goes, which you may have heard before, um, the Aztec army rushes at the Spaniards, wanting to kill them all right then and there. This is their only shot to kill, to, to defeat Cortes. Outnumbered, the Spaniards against all odds charge back. Cortes, being the military genius that he was, identified the Siwakoat, the Grand Vizier of the Aztec Empire, that was leading the army, supposedly because he was carrying a great banner. And then Cortes and other cavalrymen lance him. Now, Cortes or someone named Juan de Salamanca seizes the banner, takes it from him that he is carrying. And the Aztec army supposedly flees in fright and disarray, and it's just the greatest victory of all time. It's an epic victory showing just how invincible and brilliant Europeans are. 
And this is an illustration from a popular book about what the Siwakoatl who Cortez struck down at Otumba looked like, holding the standard that was taken. So the story goes, the Nahuatl word for these standards is Tlawisli. Uh, and these are just various different kinds, but supposedly that, that green one right there that uh, he's holding was the one that was taken. So scholars, and this isn't just something that, you know, crazy people on the internet talk about, or it's not just like an urban legend or anything. This is something like all scholars, not just, you know, white supremacist ones, but I mean, like real people who are sympathetic to the indigenous, they all believe the story and it's never really been questioned. But what they've taken away from this was that cavalry, so horsemen and or steel weapons or armor are invincible against the indigenous, right? Uh, indigenous soldiers flee like cowards if their army's standard falls. And this is because their standards are believed to hold this magical energy, tonal. Uh, and Otumba was the Aztecs' one last chance to kill the Spaniards and stop the conquest of Mexico. So the fact that they didn't, right, when they had the advantage, I mean, shows how inferior they are, how weak they are. And it almost justifies the conquest in a way because it makes it seem these people are so weak, like they have all the advantage, right? They have their whole army out there and they still can't defeat them. Who can blame the Spaniards for taking over these weak people? Or anybody would. So overall, and I think the big conclusion you take away that most scholars take away, whether they admit it or not, whether they're actually sympathetic to the indigenous is that the Aztecs lost because they were inferior in you know, some way to Europeans. So, I mean, here's a quote from like one of the most extreme views of that, of a guy who's not quite a wingnut, you know, not quite uh, crazy, uh, but Victor Davis Hansen, uh, using Otumba's unquestionable proof of Spanish, Western, European racial, I mean, uh, sorry, not racial, cultural superiority. Uh, he, so he argued that the Battle of Otumba shows that Cortes, like other Western captains like Alexander the Great, often annihilated without mercy their numerically superior foes, not because their own soldiers were necessarily better in war, but because their traditions of free inquiry, rationalism, and science most surely were. So the Spaniards know the flags are just flags, but these simple-minded indigenous people think that their flags are magical emblems, and if you take away their flag, they have no chance of winning. So what if I told you that none of this was true? What if I offered you the red pill of history and showed you that this is all part of the colonial matrix, so to say? What if I told you that the earliest and most reliable accounts, and especially indigenous conquest accounts, don't mention anything about a stolen banner or tonal or a native retreat or a slain siwakoad? What if I told you that all the sources that do say these things borrow from a biography of Cortes written in the 1550s by someone who never set foot in Mexico? What if I told you the Aztecs didn't really have trouble fighting cavalry or Spaniards in general? That the Aztecs won more battles than they lost and that the Battle of Otumba was overall kind of a victory for them. And that the Aztecs themselves once seized the Spanish banner in a battle causing a Spanish retreat. And here's an illustration from the Florentine Codex where it shows some uh, Aztec soldiers uh, uh, taking a Spaniard off his horse. This is not an uncommon thing in the conquest. What if I told you that the reasons the Spaniards conquered Mexico had nothing to do with their supposed superiority in the battlefield and had nothing to do with the Battle of Otumba? That people have accepted this false story of Otumba because we still don't take indigenous narratives seriously enough. What if I didn't just tell you? What if I stopped uh, just talking about it and actually showed you? Let's start with the earliest conquest source. It's not even an indigenous source. By Hernando Cortes. One of the, the, probably the first Spanish document ever written in Mexico is letters that he wrote to the Emperor Charles V, uh, pretty much right after the Battle of Otumba happened. Uh, so this is from Anthony Pagan's translation. There came to meet us uh, such a multitude of Indians that the fields all around them were so full of them that nothing else could be seen. We could hardly distinguish between ourselves and them, so fiercely and closely they fight with us. Certainly we believed it was our last day, for the Indians were very strong, and we could resist but feebly as we were exhausted and nearly all of us wounded and weak from hun hunger. But our Lord was pleased to show his power and mercy, for with all our weakness, we broke their great arrogance and pride, and many of them died, including many important persons. How would he even know they're important? Uh, for they were so many that they got in each other's way and could neither fight nor run. We spent most of that day in the fight until God ordained that one of their chieftains should die, and he seemed it seemed he was of such importance that the battle ended. What are the takeaways from this? There's no mention of a standard at all. And Cortez was a very arrogant person. I mean, he was trying to inflate himself, especially before the king. And this letter was written to the king. If somebody took a flag and caused a, a retreat by it, why wouldn't he have taken credit for it? He doesn't say that he targeted a leader, just he was lucky that some chieftain, it seemed, uh, died. And his victory is more of an act of God rather than his tactical genius. And he only surmises the battle must have stopped because it seemed someone died. 
It doesn't mention a retreat, only that the battle stopped and later says that some attacks continued. The next account after this is also one that leaves a lot of these details that we all have assumed is true. And this was from Juan de Salamanca's uh, 1535 petition for a nobility. He was petitioning for a coat of arms, which he received right here, uh, which is there on the right. And the king wrote back to him saying, you, Juan de Salamanca, went with Captain Cortez and the Spaniards to the province of Otumba, where there was such a great multitude and number of Indians who attended to kill the Spaniards, and you fought with them continuously until defeating them, when you successfully identified and killed an Indian who bore a crest or plumaje of bright green feathers with gold and silver, which played a major role in pacifying the said Indians in province. So we, the royal court, order you be given a coat of arms in addition to the one your ancestors had, a shield divided with three parts in the first part in the right hand uh, side, a tuft of feathers against a red background in memory of the feather crest or penacho, which the Indian who you thus killed had, and at the top, a closed helm topped with some plumes similar to the ones that are within the said shield. What are the takeaways from this? So only now in 1535, right? So uh, um, that was uh, 15 years after the Battle of Otumba. Only now is there a mention that the captain had some kind of feather decoration, but there's still a the mention of a banner rather that there was just a feather crest. The specific words used are plumaje or penacho, like a headdress. He doesn't say it caused their retreat. And Salamanca doesn't even say that he took the feathers. Contrary to popular belief, by the way, his coat of arms doesn't show an Aztec standard plowisly, just generic feathers as if he couldn't even remember, as if it weren't even all that special anyway. Uh, I, I've heard of, from a lot of people saying that the, this coat of arms supposedly shows the standard, and I went to Spain and found it, and there's no standard, just these generic looking feathers. The story gets wilder in Lopez de Gomara's thinly veiled biography of Cortes in 1552. Uh, where he wrote, he added to the story now, and this was a guy who was Cortes' secretary in Spain. He never went to Mexico. And this was from his Cronica de la Nueva España, uh, which was actually rather, it sounds like the history of the Mexico or conquest of Mexico was really just a biography of Cortes meant to make him look as good as possible. And he wrote, many Indians charged spreading out across the countryside and surrounding them. Cortes then came upon the native who carried the royal standard of the Mexica, a captain general, throwing him to the ground and killing him. After Cortes toppled the native and his standard, the Spaniards brought down the rest of the banners and no Indian was left fighting. All dispersed as best they could, fleeing as was their habit in war. On seeing the Indians general killed and their standard lowered, our men took courage and chased them on horseback, killing an infinite number of them. From the time the Indies were discovered, there has been no greater feat or victory. So what Lopez de Gomara adds to the story and gets taken as gospel is that now Cortes doesn't just topple one banner, he topples all of them. Wow, this guy just gets cooler and cooler as history goes by. Most importantly, his comment that their habit in war was to flee is interpreted as meaning that Mesoamerican armies would automatically disperse if their banner fell and is taken as absolute fact when we will see that's preposterous. I mean, he doesn't even say that. He just says they were fleeing as was their custom in battle. He doesn't say that they flee whenever a standard is taken. And I've seen this in so many anthropology, so many history books where they claim that this was a real thing about Mesoamerican armies, that if you took their banner, they all ran away. But nobody even questions, like, this is written by a guy that never even saw an Aztec army at all. It didn't even really write that. Um, so notably, Lomas de Lopez de Gomara never went to Mexico. And stories that get bigger and more embellished by time, usually that's the hallmark, telltale hallmark of something that is not true. Bernal Lías uh, del Castillo, uh, who was a famous conquistador who wrote a book about it, uh, about the history of Mexico, about the conquest, and his unreliable conquest narrative almost completes the story. And Bernal Díaz del Castillo has, was originally taken as a guy who was more truthful than Cortes, but a lot of historical research has shown some of the stuff he comes up is just wacky. I mean, it's just absolutely false. He's not considered by, by most historians as reliable as people used to consider him. Uh, so published in 1568, his not-so-true history of the conquest of New Spain, I added the not-so part, uh, essentially just copies Salamanca and Gomara's account, but now adds one detail. Now the Spaniards seize the standard. Now they capture it. So as you can see, this is something that just gets more and more wild details as it keeps on being retold. It's a tall tale. It's not an actual historical account. So the final part of the story that the one of the, the captain general, whoever it was that was killed, was the Siwakoat himself. So that's like the vice president of the Aztec Empire, the Grand Vizier. 
uh, now the in near the end of the 19th century, now that detail gets added to the story. In the late 19th century, the great Mexican archaeologist Alfredo Chavero misread a Tlaxcalan codex uh, and the works of colonial mestizo historians and claimed that it was actually the Siwakor Matatzinkatzin who was the leader killed at Otumba and the banner that was taken was the Matlaxopil, this uh, a green thing right here. So he was reading some, some accounts by mestizo historians writing in the late 16th century who weren't fully indigenous, who claimed that there was someone important that died at that battle named Siwat Kaltzin, uh, who was also called the, uh, the Matla Shopile, so someone who had the Shopile standard. And he misread that as, oh, it's the Siwakoatl, and he has this thing called the Matla Shopile. It must be Matla Sinkatsin. Matla Sinkatsin must have been named after this standard. And oh, so it was the Siwakoatl that was killed. But what do indigenous sources say? The Nahuatl historian Chimalpain and other Nahuatl historian accounts wrote that the Siwakoatl Matatzinkatzin was present at the coronation of the Aztec emperor Cuitlahuac, who was crowned after Montezuma was killed by the Spaniards, after the Battle of Otumba. There's no way the Siwakoatl could have died on the battlefield, which no indigenous source says. The Xopili is shown in the Codex Mendoza to the right, not as the standard of the Aztec army, but rather as heraldry of warriors of the Otomit rank. This is from the Codex Mendoza uh, on the right there, and he's carrying the Xopili standard right there, uh, actually tied to his back anyway. Not The Essex didn't really carry flags. They had them tied to their back, like uh, the shimonos that Japanese uh, samurai wore. According to the Florentine Codex, also, there was no main banner used by the army, but rather several were carried into battle. And the Tlawisli, the, these, these standards, were tied to the soldiers' backs. The anonymous conquistador wrote that they could not be removed from their bear without hacking the bear to pieces. So if one of these horsemen actually stole one of these things, they would have to get off their horse and basically cut the standard off of the person. Uh, I don't have any good pictures showing how they were tied, but they were tied with this bamboo-like uh, uh, network to the back of a warrior with rope. So book 12 of the Florentine Codex to the right, we're looking at indigenous sources now, is the only written indigenous record of the Battle of Otumba. The, and it, the fact that no other indigenous written source even remembers the battle actually says how little it mattered to them and how little I think it mattered to indigenous history. Most indigenous historians knew that the whole Noche Triste and that whole time the Aztecs were chasing the Spaniards out to Tlaxcala was a huge defeat for the Spaniards. Even if they did kill some kind of commander at Otumba, I mean, they, the Spaniards were basically the ones who were defeated at the time. I think most indigenous people realize that and so it didn't really see much of a point of even writing about the Battle of Otumba. But there is one account of it in Book 12 of the Florentine Codex, which is a Nahuatl source. And I will read it to you all to kind of let indigenous people speak. And this is my uh, translation from the Nahuatl. And so it says, uh, chapter 27, at the same time the Mexica or Aztecs arrived near the Spanish camp at a mountain called Mount Donansin, which is shown right here, to try to stop them from getting away. That's an important word. We'll get to that. They set up camp at the foot of a mountain called Tonan. And once the Spaniards had started moving out and resumed their course, the sentries who were watching at the top of the mountain shouted out, Oh, Mexica, oh, Aztecs, your enemies are now leaving. We must all ready ourselves to move and leave. No one is to stay behind. Upon hearing this, everyone ran out and rushed out and assumed the pursuit. And when the Spaniards saw them coming, they waited for them to arrive. Here are the Spaniards uh, watching them now. They laid in wait to confront them, intensely planning and deliberating what they would do with them. The Spaniards on horseback then charged at them and threw themselves at the Aztecs. Those on foot, the Spaniards who were on foot, who were inside some houses, rushed out with them. People were stabbed and trampled. Trampled. A great many died there, Mexica and Tlatelolca alike, for they only delivered themselves to the Spaniards, hurling themselves into their hands, pursuing nothing more than death. Only a few of these warriors emerged unscathed, but those who stayed back those who kept at them from a distance did not die. The Spaniards quickly went off after satisfying their bloodlust, all their porters following behind. No one knows where the Spaniards spent the night from then on. It was then that they, the Aztec army, headed back and stopped following the Spaniards, leaving them behind. Afterwards, the bodies of the dead were all identified and burnt there. And this is most important. When the Spaniards had gone, it was thought they were gone forever. They were gone for good. They would never again return ever. The Mexica then, when they returned to Tenochtitlan, held a great feast when it was thought that the Spaniards had left Mexico. So this is totally different from the Spanish accounts. Book 12 
So taking the takeaways from this, Book 12, the only nautical account of the conquest, says that, did not say that the Mexica were trying to kill all the Spaniards right then and there, but rather trying to stop them from getting too far away. I think to stop them from getting too far ahead. If the Mexica really wanted to try to engage the Spaniards head on and kill them all right then and there, they could have done so earlier. The Mexica before the Battle of Otumba were camped out by Mount, Don by Mount Donan, which was not that far from the Spaniard camp. They could have all rushed at them. The Mexica came out, the Aztecs came out when they saw that the Spaniards were getting away. I think that they were trying to still follow them to try to pick off uh, uh, from the Spanish army rather than having some kind of great confrontation right there and killing them all. There's no mention of a captured banner or the death of any important leader or a retreat. It's true that they do mention that a lot of, of the Mexica had died there, that there were a lot of casualties, but this was because I don't think they were expecting the Spaniards to charge back. And this happened to be on a very level field where cavalry would have had the maximum impact. Uh, Cortes wrote that there were the Mexica were so close together that they could neither run nor fight. So they were probably bunched too closely together. The Spaniards caught them unaware. And the uh, Aztec weapons, if you've ever seen them, the Makwawit, which were these uh, clubs that were studded with obsidian blades, could only slash, not stab. So if all the, warrior, all the soldiers there are in close quarters, they would have some trouble using their weapons because they're sl slashing weapons. You need a considerable distance in order to use them. You need to be spread out a bit. And if we go back and look at the illustration here, you do see that the Spaniards are killing some of the warriors. But if you notice there in the back lines there, the warriors are not in retreat. The soldiers are still there standing defiantly. And in this account, it does say that those who stayed back did not die, that they still kept at them from a distance. It's only the front lines that get decimated. And it says there specifically that they delivered themselves to the Spaniards, hurling themselves into their hands, pursuing nothing more than death. So I think some of these frontliners knew that they were going to die anyway, and they knew this was kind of a suicide charge, but maybe were hoping to overwhelm the Spaniards. Uh, in in Nautil sources, it talks about what a good soldier does in those terms, that a good soldier hurls himself to his death, doesn't run away, that uh, wants only death, loves only death. Uh, there was a similar, I guess, to the Vikings, there was ethos among the Aztecs that the most honorable thing was to die in war. But the most important part is that the feeling afterwards is one of triumph and celebration, that the Spaniards were defeated, that they had killed almost all, they had killed almost all Cortes' original force by then. Cortes had something like 1,000, 1,500 men with him and was down to like 300 and just a few horses. And they were basically already out of the empire and seemingly gone forever. Anybody at the time would have thought that the Spaniards were basically defeated. And there was one thing that would happen later that would end up changing all that. But this really seemed like a victory. Uh, you could see that they were, that they cleaned up the temples afterward. They crowned a new Aztec emperor. Everything just seemed like it was fine. Like this was not a, a moment of tremendous sadness. They had lost plenty of warriors at the Battle of Otumba, some of the frontliners there. But their overall army, I mean, they still had hundreds of thousands of soldiers at their disposal. It was Cortes and his men who were defeated, who had to run back cowardly to their allies in Tlaxcala, who could not mount any more attacks. I mean, this was just cherry picking the fact that, okay, the Spaniards killed some people at Otumba. I mean, it's just preposterous. And I think to indigenous people, it seemed preposterous, which is why they never even really wrote about that battle. Okay, so you killed some Aztecs. All right, well, almost your whole force almost got killed by them. Big freaking deal. And if we look... If we look at the map again, if we go back here, Otumba, you notice, is almost out of Aztec imperial territory. It's just about a day's ride away from Tlaxcala, from Apan. They were basically almost out of the empire then. So, I mean, to the Mexica, it was like, well, I don't know. Why, I mean, why keep on pursuing them? They're basically already defeated. They're basically already out of our hair. Cortes and several other Spaniards mentioned that some attacks continued. So even if the main Aztec army returned to Tenochtitlan, uh, there were still some other forces still pursuing the Spaniards along the way anyway. Reading this as a total devastating Aztec defeat, I mean, it's just silly. The Aztecs were the ones who came out of this one in an advantageous position, not really the Spaniards. In fact, Cortes, when he returned to Tlaxcala, was said to have sat under uh, a a willow tree and cried basically because of how badly he was defeated.
So returning back to our discussion of the battle here, then what we can conclude from this is that the Battle of Tumba was not like some kind of monumental Spanish victory. The Spanish succeeded in killing several in the Aztec front lines and couldn't really do anything to the rest of the army. And they were the ones that ended up in a defeated position. And it was the Aztecs who celebrated, who seemed like everything, who thought that everything seemed to be going their way. But even if that story of a stolen banner was false, there actually, though, there was a true story of a banner captured during the conquest which did cause a great retreat. And by the way, book 12, I mean, there, there's no way there could have been an Aztec retreat because it says that after the battle, the uh, uh, bodies of the dead uh, Aztec soldiers were burnt right there. So the Aztecs did not leave that battlefield. They eventually returned to Tenochtitlan. Um, and they said that they didn't even know where the Spaniards spent that night, which I think meant that they had lost interest in the Spaniards anyway. Uh, you notice the active voice that is used in there uh, let me turn on my pointer again. It was then that they, the Aztec army headed back and stopped following the Spaniards, leaving them behind. So it was in the Aztecs leaving them behind, not fleeing. They're leaving the Spaniards behind. Like they don't even care about them anymore. They're no longer a threat out of sight, out of mind. But there was a true story, though, similar to the Battle of Otumba, actually, where there was a banner captured and there was an ensuing cowardly retreat. But guess who it was? It was a Spanish flag that was captured. And this was a very famous event. And unlike the Battle of Otumba, actually, several Nahuatl sources remember this. Uh, according to the Florentine Codex and several other sources, in the summer of 1521, during the Spanish siege of Tenochtitlan, uh, when the Spaniards returned and besieged Tenochtitlan, Aztec soldiers, in a brilliant counterattack, let loose, as they said, that's the actual language used, and counterattacked the Spanish besiegers in what is now San Martin in uh, La Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico City. The Aztecs captured the Spanish flag, made them retreat, and captured 53 Spaniards and four horses after having also defeated them a day before. There was another victory that happened before then, and it was actually really brilliant. Well, they feigned a retreat, so they made the Spaniards think that the, the Mexica were finally going to give up during the siege. So all the Spaniards ran across some of the bridges into the city, but while they were doing that, the Aztecs then took the bridges away and then stopped pretending to retreat and then chased the Spaniards back. The Spaniards get to the edge of the water. Spain is a very dry country. Most Spaniards didn't even know how to swim. They all get stuck in the mud there. And it's a huge victorious uh, um, triumph for the Mexica. Here's an illustration of uh, one of the Aztec people, one of the Aztec soldiers stealing the Spanish flag, taking captives, and then leading the Spanish prisoners off to their deaths. And this was after another victory that they had. Why isn't the Aztec victory of the Battle of San Martin remembered like Otumba? Why isn't it used as proof of Aztec superiority? So even Spaniards admitted that they and their horses have frequently lost. I mean, for all their bragging, I mean, they were often pretty honest. Bernal Diaz del Castillo, the big Otumba legend guy, right? What does he say? I will not relate how they wounded the horses, nor were the horses of any use to us, because although the horsemen charged the squadrons to break through them, so many arrows, darts, and stones were hurled at, at the horses and the Spaniards on them that although the Spaniards were well protected by armor, they could not prevail against the enemy. And here's an illustration, actually, of a Spanish horseman. It's by great art by an amazing artist, Keith Henderson. I love that series of illustrations if you want to look it up. Um, of one of the Spaniards who, when they were the ones besieged in Tenochtitlan before the Battle of Otumba, that tried riding his horse out of the Aztec palace where the Spaniards were holding up and is then completely overwhelmed by Aztec soldiers. I think I already showed this illustration in the beginning of, of Aztec soldiers taking a Spaniard off his horse during the siege of Tenochtitlan. Uh, in fact, Matthew Restall is another historian. I mean, it's pointed out that Francisco Pizarro, the, the, con the conqueror of Peru, actually preferred to fight on foot because horses were not as invincible against indigenous people as we often think that they are. There, I mean, and, this illustration from the Florentine Codex is one of like 20, I got folders full of them, of, of illustrations of indigenous people toppling Spaniards off their horses. And I've always, you know, when I first started reading this history, I thought this whole thing that whole cavalry is invincible is just so goofy and stupid because these people were used to killing deer. I mean, what is a horse but an overgrown deer? Like they have atlas, spear throwers, they have all kinds of projectiles. They can't kill a Spanish horse? Seriously? 
And, and just before the Battle of Otumba, actually, the Aztecs, so when they were chasing the Spaniards along the countryside up on the road to Otumba, they had killed several horses. And the conquistadors actually remember being so desperate for food, they just ate one of the dead horses. So then it might seem like I'm making excuses here. Am I trying to make indigenous people seem like they're uh, the, the real uh, winners? But I mean, the ultimate reality we have to accept is the Spaniards won in the end. So why did they? Uh, it, if I'm not just making up excuses, because they continue to, Spaniards continue to receive reinforcements while Aztec numbers were whittled down through combat and attrition and disease. So the, the Aztecs are winning these victories, but every time they win victories, they're still losing lots of men. Whereas the Spaniards, Mexico is right off the coast of the Caribbean, and people always forget about this. You know, every, there's that common phrase that the Spaniards conquered Mexico and Peru with only a handful of men. Um, actually, the, several handfuls that kept on coming, replacing the dead. Uh, Matthew Restall has actually calculated that Cortes lost two thirds of, of his men during the conquest, which is an exceptionally high attrition rate uh, for an army. Uh, there were lots of Spaniards killed, but the, Cortes could always send off little bits of gold to the Caribbean, to Cuba, Puerto Rico, and that would attract more Spaniards' attentions. And so then they would go and join up with him. In fact, the Florentine Codex says that was the reason why the Spaniards were able to come back and conquer Tenochtitlan after the Battle of Otumba. And I quote, and I read it from you there, the Spaniards healed their wounds after the Battle of Otumba and gathered strength in the city of Tlaxcala. The Tlaxcalans were under indigenous people that were allied with Spaniards for more than half a year. There were too few of them to give battle to the Mexica or Aztecs again. During this interval, a Francisco Hernandez, a Spaniard, arrived in Tlaxcala with 300 Spanish soldiers and many horses weapons, pieces of artillery, and munitions. With this, Captain Don Hernando Cortes uh, and some other Spaniards uh, took courage to outfit themselves again and conquer Mexico back. So Cortes was waiting there in Tlaxcala, unable to do anything. He was the real one defeated after Otumba and is only able to succeed because reinforcements come from the Caribbean. And what's going on with the Aztecs this whole time? Smallpox, as you can see in this illustration, is decimating them, possibly killing 25%. They had already lost plenty of warriors in expelling uh, uh, the Spaniards out of Tenochtitlan, and now they had to contend with smallpox. And so decisive battles like Otumba aren't decisive at all. The real reason why the Spaniards won is because they had a constant stream of Europeans, of Spanish people joining their campaign constantly throughout the whole conquest. So even if, even if, the Mexica really would have exterminated every single Spaniard at Otumba. Another expedition force would have come, and maybe the Aztecs would have prevailed against them. Maybe they wouldn't have. Uh, uh, similarly, I mean, even if the Spaniards won at Otumba, that had nothing to do with the final conflict. The real decisive factor was disease and constant Spaniards coming in. And that's actually a decisive factor for the colonization of North America. Europeans everywhere outside of Mexico lost to indigenous people all the time, the only reason the colonizers prevailed was because there was a constant stream of people coming from Europe and diseases were whittling down indigenous people. Indigenous people couldn't get reinforcements from outside of the continent. So why do we believe the myths about the Battle of Otumba, but we forget real indigenous victories? And this is an illustration from the Florentine Codex of a famous Aztec soldier named Tzilakatzin, who was said to have killed single-handedly several Spaniards. So why do we forget about people like him? Because we're so inculcated, I think, with the myth of European superiority that we just assume indigenous people could never triumph against colonizers. I mean, to be fair, people do know about the Noche Triste that I mentioned, but I think that's because that was just such a big battle, so essential to the conquest history timeline that you can't really forget about that. But I think we assume that indigenous people, even those of us sympathetic to them, I think, assume that they were just so weak and powerless. You know, they had Stone Age technology, not entirely true. The Aztecs knew how to uh, um, work with copper, actually. But it's just, Otumba happened the way it did, right? A Spaniard stole the flag and made them all run because how could it not have happened? Europeans are superior. We just assume that that kind of thing happened because it had to have happened. And we still don't give indigenous historical texts the full respect they deserve. They're just there to add an indigenous perspective to a story of an inve inevitable European triumph anyway. It's just window dressing. And I think that's the wrong attitude. Because if you start with book 12, if you start with the indigenous accounts, you will never believe anything about some goofy story about a Spaniard stealing a magical banner that makes the whole Aztec army run away. 
right? I mean, it's just such a dumb story. If that were really true, why didn't they just go in every battle and just take the enemy's banner, right? And then just conquer the whole Aztecs that way. Why did they run to Tlaxcala? Why didn't they just, after the Battle of Otumba, go right back to Tenochtitlan and, you know, just start stealing flags, right? I mean, it, it's a goofy story. And I think if we take indigenous texts seriously with the seriousness they deserve, we wouldn't fall for these goofy stories. And there's so many other things like that, like about the Aztecs thinking the Spaniards were gods, um, like about Montezuma having the zoo where he fed people the animals, all stuff that other historians have debunked. And that's a topic for another talk. But we all believe these dumb things because we don't hear indigenous voices enough. And that's that. That's it. Thank you so much for that. Um, a little virtual round of applause for Dr. Mendoza. Um, my name is Nat. Um, our, hi, everyone. This is Nat speaking. And I'm the LCC program coordinator. And I'll be faci facilitating our Q&A section for this program. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Mendoza, for your presentation and for sharing your research with us. Um, it was really awesome. It was very lively, very fun. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you, but we also want to open up the space and invite the audience to ask their questions as, fun as well. Um, so if you have any questions, please post your questions on the chat or raise your hand under the reaction button on Zoom. Um, and then I can call on you so that we're so that you're able to unmute your mic and say your question. Um, and so while we wait for folks to gather their thoughts, we're going to begin with the first question, um, oh, which I see in the chat. It also has two first questions right now. Um, so her first question is, what has been the reaction to your findings from scholars who supported the Spanish victory in this battle? Um, and if you're able to answer within time, are your findings prompting curriculum revisions in primary and secondary education in Mexico and abroad? Hello, thank you. I'm glad you asked that question, right? Because I this so I should have mentioned it. This is all part of an article that I have under review for a journal, actually. So it's not, but I've given talks on it and I've shared the paper. And a colleague ever said to me, he said, This is like I think this is the exact word. This is straight up scandalous. This is straight up scandalous. How does how does these, these stories? I mean, why do people even believe them? Right. And it's just we just assume that they're true. We don't question it because well, how would the Europeans have conquered Mexico if they didn't have amazing victories like that? So, I mean, I would like for this to, to prompt revisions, right? And this is kind of a side project. This is not the main monograph that I'm doing, but it's connected to the monograph, which is about the extended history of the conquest, about the consolidation of Spanish power in Mexico after the conquest. But it is related to it um, because one of the things I argue, I'm going to argue in my monograph is that Spaniards were continuously afraid of indigenous people. And that can't be true unless indigenous people are actually capable of winning victories against Europeans. So, yeah, I, I hope this is really going to shake up a lot when it's it's more thoroughly published. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and then we have another question. So, of course, all of us who join come from our own perspective fields, majors, our own um, our own departments. And so often, of course, as you said, indigenous perspectives are disregarded, especially in our STEM fields. How can we continue to promote indigenous perspectives in our own perspective fields, majors, and you know, kind of livelihoods? Yes, thank you. Another amazing question. Uh, there has been since about like the 1980s this frenzy of translations of indigenous documents, uh, and so I, there's all kinds of readers out there. And you, there's the you probably heard maybe many of you have read it, uh, the Broken Spears uh, by Miguel Leon Portilla. That one's kind of outdated. Uh, but that one is a, a translation of, of uh, translation. It's a collection of translations of indigenous conquest accounts. There's so many of them. A really good one is Victors and Vanquished, right? There's 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 lots of translations of indigenous documents now. And I think the best way to do that is to start with them. Uh, this was like a, a controversial part of my first draft of the paper. And the conclusion, I said, let's not both sides this. We need to give indigenous people primate, like their account of it needs to be considered first. And I recommend starting with them. But one of the reviewers said, I really wish that he would tone down the extremism of the conclusion. Like, OK, I mean, I thought university academia is supposed to be so woke. I thought we were all about indigenous power anyway. All right. OK. I mean, I guess I'll have to tone that down. Uh, but that is really what I believe. And it's not just because, you know, I went to a reservation, I got a dream catcher and I'm cool. with You know, I think their culture is so mystical and cool, man. No, it, it's not about that. Um, even other historians have written, like indigenous people just had much less incentive to lie. The, all the Spaniards, all these writings that they're doing, they're all trying to one-up each other so that they can get the most rewards from the king. 
Whereas indigenous people, I mean, they're not going to get any rewards for having fought against the Spaniards, right? They're writing these memories to keep their own stories alive. And so I think they have more of incentive, to be honest. So I recommend finding these indigenous translations in, in uh, readers and books and starting with that primarily. Um, and there's a the, the Florentine Codex, all these illustrations, I got them from the uh, uh, Florentine Codex digital project, which that one's up online. So that book 12, that source has been translated in English twice. And it translations of it, both translations in English and in Spanish are online as part of a digital Florentine Codex uh, project by the Getty Institute. And it grew, awesomely enough, you can also listen to a modern Nahua speaker reading that text in Nahua, in modern Nahuatl, actually. So, I mean, that, that's a way to also incorporate modern indigenous people into these projects. I mean, I think who also, uh, their perspective should be taken account. I'm doing a chapter in a book actually where about the aftermath of the contest conquest where every single chapter, um, which features a translation of a Nahuatl document has an introduction written by a modern indigenous person. It's called 1522 after the broken spears. That's a great source to start with if you're an educator wanting to incorporate indigenous perspectives. Awesome. Thank you for that and for the recommended readings. Um, next, we're, so we're, we do have a few questions coming in, so we're going to be able to get to as many of them as we can before time. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Kevin Schultz, who has their hand raised. Are you with us, Kevin? I hope so. Hi, Kevin. Go ahead. Hey, so everybody, my name is Kevin Schultz. I'm the chair of the Department of History where Celso is housed. So um I've heard some of Celso's talks before. Good stuff, Celso. And I really you. enjoyed your talk and all of your talks so far. Um, so my question, so I everybody, I do US and American history. And so in in the United States, we've been dealing with sort of the exact same push that Celso is forcing us with a lot of scholarship coming out, like the Comanche Empire and things like that, which are demonstrating the strength of indigenous people in a way that we're revising our understanding of conquest in, in exactly the same way that Celso has just done for us. So Celso is part of this really interesting and important wave of scholars that's coming through, not alone, but I think he is really spearheading this one that's dealing with the Aztec battle. So, so Celso, my question for you is if you could just give us a little bit of a teaser on other things that focusing on indigenous sources have taught you as opposed to just maybe the fact that we got this battle wrong. So let's say we assume indigenous the strength of indigenous peoples all the way back into the 1500s and the 1600s. What are some of the other things that are going to force us to revise? I mean, I know from reading like 1491 and 1493, they, shocked, they talked a lot about how the land was revised and things that we assumed were rivers were once canals and things that we assumed were hills were once pyramids. What are some of the other things that indigenous sources are gonna teach us by focusing on them first? Sure, right, thank you, thank you for that. And yeah, I definitely see myself as being a part of this vein of historiography. And you know, I'm not trying to act like indigenous people are invincible, but this is just the reality that Europeans really had their hands full uh, and the author of the Comanche Empire that uh, uh, Professor Schultz uh, brought up, he's done a recent book called um, Indigenous America, where he says we shouldn't even call it colonial America, we should call it indigenous America because it was mostly in indigenous hands until the 1800s. Now about other things specific to Mexico that other indigenous accounts will reveal is that what were this so-called conquest of Mexico was really just the conquest of the Aztec empire, which was just one part of Mexico. And by conquest, what it really means, and this is what my main monograph project is about, it just means the temporary defeat of the Aztec Imperial Army. The Spaniards don't even charge all the indigenous people that are tribute until the 1560s. They're still going out in all directions, having to conquer all these different other people, because Mexico is not just about the Aztecs, right? After the fall of the state line, uh, the Spaniards have to go to Oaxaca to try to conquer Mixtecs, Zapotecs. They go to the coastline to conquer Huastecs. They have to go to Michoacan to try to conquer the Purepecha. And then they really get their hands full in the north of Mexico and the south in the Mayan areas, which, I mean, takes centuries to conquer, if you can even call it that. So I think one of the things indigenous sources will reveal about that is what a slow, gradual, and incomplete process this whole thing of conquest is. And Matthew Restall, one of my favorite historians, even says we shouldn't call it the conquest of Mexico. We should call it the Spanish-Aztec War. And I mean, unfortunately, conquest is just so stuck and so ingrained with us that it's 
difficult for me to even use that that language properly and for everyone to understand what I'm talking about. But yeah, I, I agree with that. And in fact, if we read indigenous accounts, they don't call it a conquest. They call it a war. Yaoyot. They call it war. And, and that's basically what it was. So thanks for the excellent question, Kevin. Great, thank you for that. Um, next, I'm gonna pass it over to Caitlin, who will most likely be our last question um, for today's Q&A. Oh, hi, um, I'm Caitlin. I guess I just have a question about like, so you were talking about like about, about the Budapachan, how, you know, it was like several like wars, there wasn't really a conquest. And I remember right. very briefly like learning about that, but I was wondering if you had any like, so, uh, sorry, okay, my original question was like, I know you said you were using like your own translations and stuff like that, but it was it's in classical Nahuatl, right? So I was going to ask like, kind of like, what are the kind of difficulties of translating classical Nahuatl into English and like what's kind of missed in these translations that like don't like necessarily like translate well into English? So I, I guess just questions about translation. Right. Sorry. No, no, that should always be, right? Like why... Um... There should always be that question when a translation is, is being uh, quoted, like how accurate is this? The fortunate thing with classical Nahuatl is, I mean, in any language, right, there's going to be things that are not uh, uh, properly understood. But because the Spanish friars were just so interested in Nahuatl, uh, it's so extensively documented. And Nahuatl actually was not just the language of the Aztecs, but it was used as a lingua franca throughout Mexico and possibly even in the southwestern United States. Uh, so Spaniards, I mean, they knew Nahuatl was the key to communicating with indigenous people. So we have so many dictionaries, so many like dialogues, like manuals on greetings and things like that, that I think we can be relatively pretty sure about what indigenous people are thinking. Um, one of the things I think we have a lot of trouble with studying, which comes into play in uh, uh, the conquest, is words having to do with indigenous religion. Uh, which is something that we don't understand well, obviously, because Spaniards tried to eradicate indigenous religion, like the word Teot, which we would think means God, right? And so when it says, when they're calling the Spaniards, you know, the Teot, right, gods, we think, oh, they thought they were gods. But it's a super complex term, Teot. I mean, it can mean to, it can be mean to you someone who's just very powerful, somebody who's very elite. And a lot of historians have done work on just that word and how it's used in these texts. To, uh, to argue that, no, they didn't think that the Spaniards were gods, right? So that, I mean, the, the stuff about religion is often uh, very, very uh, complex and is still not well understood. So that can cloud our our understandings. But I think our understandings of most novel vocabulary and grammar are, are pretty good. And I think we can understand relatively well uh, what indigenous people were saying and thinking at the time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Dr. Mendoza, for your talk and for all of you for joining us today. Um, a quick shameless plug, we do have a next presentation in our series coming up on Wednesday, March 13th. So coming up in just a few short weeks, um, we're going to be having Dr. Carla Tejada Lopez from the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering providing a talk on her research here with us. Um, it's also going to be virtual and we dropped an RSVP link in the um, in the chat. And we do have two minutes left. So Dr. Mendoza, if there's anything you'd like to, your final say in the last minute or two, please feel free to do so. Yeah, yeah. So another shameless plug for me in the spring uh, semester, uh, next academic year, I'm going to teach a whole course just on the conquest, on the conquest itself, my favorite topic. So if you like this, you'll, you'll get more of that if you sign up for my course. Thank you so much. Again, thanks for everyone who attended and we hope to see you at our next presentation. Yeah, another little virtual round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.